So welcome everyone, session nine, where we're going to go, like I said, through groundwater in mining. And what we'll go through in the session is, first we'll go through the schedule, just the, the sessions remaining. Then we'll go overview of the mining methods that we typically encounter, the mining life cycle, which is something that's quite important for your studies, and then some groundwater applications in mining. And then we'll go to questions. So today we're doing groundwater in mining. And then on the 17th of September, we'll go through groundwater management and monitoring, you know, monitoring network design, monitoring program design, and then groundwater management plans, which will include your groundwater efficiency or water efficiency plans as well, which is something that people are starting to implement more and more. Then on the 24th of September, we'll do the specialist applications. And we've got the groundwater and underground mining and tunnels as suggested by Antonio. Um, your dewatering strategy design, which I see is just suggested now in the chat. And then mine hydrogeochemistry as well, that Lizelle has asked for. Is there anything else that you guys can think of that you would like in that sort of special session? That. If there's anything you guys just send an email or post it on the group, you know, we've got the LinkedIn group. Um, so just post it in there and then we can include it in that special session at the, the end of September. Antonio wants to go through isotopes. Yeah, that's also a very interesting one, um, Antonio. We'll include that. I'm just going to make a note here the isotopes for uh, source characterization. Yeah, great. Okay, so we're just gonna start with an overview of the different mining methods, the common mining methods we encounter. Yeah, a mine is the excavation that's made into the earth to extract minerals for beneficiation. And mining is the extraction, processing, and sale of minerals. Yeah, some of the key definitions that you'd need to know in the mining industry, you know, because it has its own language almost. Uh, the key ones is ore, which is a mineral deposit which has sufficient value and demand to be mined at a profit. Gang or gang mineralogy is the mineral particles within an ore deposit that must be discarded. So that's like your um, in between your gold or platinum, that would be gang. And then waste material is the, the material that you have to go through to reach the ore deposit. So generally you'll talk about waste and gang as the same thing, but sometimes you would have specific uh, gang mineralogy. Then metallic ores is your ferrous metals, base metals, precious metals, and radioactive minerals, such as your copper, gold, iron ore, platinum, rare earth elements, etc. Your non-metallic minerals, also called industrial minerals, your potash, halite, gravel, sand, limestone, dimension stone, and then the fossil fuels, which I think a lot of us have had exposure to in, in the form of coal. And other fossil fuels would be natural gas and tar sands. So there's two types of mining. Yeah, which is your surface mining, where mining takes place on the surface and includes methods such as open pit, strip mining, solution mining, and placer mining. And then underground mining, where your mining takes place under the surface and mining methods include your unsupported, supported, or caving methods. Yeah, this is a picture of a, an edit going into a decline shaft. And in the background there, you can see the main shaft already at the mine. Okay, so surface mining, you get your strip mining, where we use this in relatively horizontal deposits, where your overburden and your deposits are relatively thin. So, uh, yeah, 
So this is sort of what we do in, in open cast mining in South Africa quite often, because you'll have your solid block coal over there and then your overburden, which is typically your shales and a bit of soil on top. So you'll mine out this strip here, and use that material to go back into your uh, previous voids. So you do concurrent rehabilitation. So you can see your mining is progressing towards the left and then your unmined areas at the back, the rehabilitated areas and your active mining area and your unsettled rehabilitated area. Like I said, you remove your material to expose your mineral deposit and then you put your waste behind you in your previous cuts. Your lateral advanced multi-bench mining. This is where your deposit is still relatively horizontal, but the overburden is too thick to allow direct casting. So for example, at this mine, you start at the top of the hill and you strip down going in a direction and then they were gonna go extend in this left uh, direction here because the deposit wasn't, um, the overburden was too thick for you to do strip mining. So you remove your overburden, you transport it out of the, the pit and you put it on a temporary waste, waste rock dump here and you rehabilitate it at a later stage. So it's not concurrent rehabilitation. And the last kind of surface mining is a conical open pit where your ore deposit is irregular, inclined or pipe shaped. Can anybody tell me what a, a common pipe shaped deposit would be? Timberlight. There we go. You know, you'll often see the diamond mines. They've got these multiple benches and they mine sort of in a corkscrew pattern going straight down like this one here where you've got your kimberlite pipes and then you're going down in a conical conical shape and your mine gets narrower and narrower as you go down. You typically you use a truck and shovel method and you've got multiple benches as in this previous picture here. Each of these benches is between three and five meters high and you go down like that and you get narrower and narrower as you get to the base. Everybody happy with open cost, open pit mining, surface mining? Yes. Yes. Well, now we go into the more complicated underground mining. Yeah, these two pictures is just the sort of main terminologies that we use in underground mining. So you'll have your incline shaft where you go down with your staff and um, big equipment. Then you can have a, a straight vertical shaft for lifting your ore body out and sometimes your staff. Like on the, the old underground mines, you've got your staff going down the vertical shafts. Then you've got your drive shafts or your stopes coming out of the incline and the, the main haulage shaft. Sometimes you'll have a crushing plant underground. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to look at what's important here. And you'll have, like I'm sure you you would have seen if you studied at Free State or Poch, you know, like at the Margaret Shaft and the, the old gold mines, you have multiple levels where you've got your dewatering product stored underground and you'll pump it from one level to the other one and then eventually up to surface. And so you'll have these sort of underground dams at multiple levels. And then important is your ventilation shafts. Uh, this is something that's where I grew up. There were a lot of abandoned ventilation shafts that were just left open you know, in the East Rand there. And I think in the West Rand, it's also not as big a problem, but there are, if you're walking in the felt, you'll see a ventilation shaft there. Yeah. And then you've got your decline as well. The decline shaft sort of goes down in a corkscrew pattern. This one, I've seen it in Hotazal where they go through the Kalahari sands in this sort of decline pattern to get to the manganese ore. Is that your basic terms? So the first type of underground mining is an unsupported type of mining. 
We extract deposits that are roughly tabular, such as your coal deposits. Yeah, it's unsupported because there's no artificial supports to support the mine roof. There are still rock bolts and anchors, etc. Yeah, but there's no uh, support slats or beams in the underground mines. Most commonly is a room and pillar or a board and pillar, where minerals are extracted in a regular pattern and the pillars are left to support the roof. This is what we do in the, the underground coal mines in South Africa. Yeah, where you can see your mine in between the pillars. So you create like a room and then the pillar is obviously the pillar. Oops. And this is what your mine plans look like. It's like a honeycomb type of effect almost. And then sometimes at the end of mining, after they've done the board and pillar, they'll go and do total extraction or stooping, you know, where they do complete removal of the, the pillars. I don't know, Amant, can you add to this at Cecil, your experience with the board and pillar? Yeah, it's exactly uh, like you mentioned. So it, we just investigate in terms of risk. So your board and pillar doesn't have that much risk to surface in terms of subsidence, but when they do total extraction, there is some risk of subsidence to surface. So we basically, we focus on that from our side. But yeah, like you mentioned, it's pretty much similar. That's it, you know, and uh, like Amant was saying, when you do the total extraction, um, you know, like what's happened at the Matla mine in uh, the ESCOM mine there is where they've done the stooping, the total extraction, you've got subsidence. So that's a problem. Number one, obviously the subsidence on surface, but number two, you've created a, a straight channel for, for surface water to enter your mining area. So if you stoop too early, you can increase your, your water make in the mine you know, increase the amount of water that you need to pump out. So you have to be very careful when you go to stooping or total extraction. Okay, second type is a supported one. This is where the stope is not sufficiently stable to remain open without artificial supports. And the ground conditions are typically between moderate and incompetent. Um, this one you see a lot in the, like the bushveld does it because the rock swells. And then in DRC, in the copper belt, where you've got the hard rock intermixed with like highly weathered rock, they have to put in um, grouting supports and then proper steel supports as well to keep the shafts open. And three types of supported mining. So you cut and fill stoping, where you backfill previous mined areas to hold the stope open. Then still stoping and square set stoping. Yeah, cut and fill stoping is the one that's most commonly applied nowadays in supported mining because it can support automated methods such as continuous miners and uh, proper me mechanized mining. Whereas your other two are quite labor and cost intensive. So people do try to stay away from it. But in Africa, we do that because labor is quite readily available and um, you know the economic benefits are, are, are quite a bit more than the automated mining methods. Okay, is there any questions about the mining methods up to this point? Any clarification needed? Anything you want me to go through in more detail or you're happy to carry on? Okay, we'll carry on. So something that's very important when you're doing a groundwater study for a mine is to know where it is in the mining life cycle. Yeah, a mining operation is a, it's almost like a living, breathing thing. There are so many moving parts in a mine and um, the life cycle stages are very distinct. They overlap, yes, but um, there's very distinct risks in terms of groundwater, both to the mine from groundwater and to the environment from mining. So your five stages of a life of mine, or LOM, which you'll see in the reports quite often, is your exploration and design, and the construction, operational, or extraction phase, then your closure and decommissioning and your post-closure. 
So there's five distinct phases. Sometimes you put the exploration and construction together, but there's very different risks and tasks associated with these two stages. And what we call it in the mining industry, in these first two phases, you call it a greenfield site. And then when it's operational and onwards, it's a brownfield site. This is a term that can be confusing early in your career if you see a greenfield versus brownfield. Okay, so in the exploration phase, your main aim in the exploration and design phase is to characterize the deposit and determine the most economic, sustainable method to extract, process, and sell the ore for benefit. Your activities on the mine include your prospecting, both indirect through geophysics and geochemistry, direct prospecting, which is your drilling, deposit modeling, you model the extent and the grade of your deposit. Then you choose your mining method, which will be open pit, uh, underground, etc. See which one would work best to get the most value. Then you go on to your project feasibility studies, pre-feasibility and then bankable feasibility. And finally, you do your licensing studies, which would be your prospecting applications, mining rights applications, EIAs, EMPs, etc. This lasts between one and five years. It, cost, it can cost anywhere between half a million up to $15 million, depending on the depth of your drilling, the size of your deposit. Yeah, the bigger the deposit, the more you have to be confident, etc. Yeah, so this is just a picture of a site. Uh, you'll see I've used the same site through all the life cycle, just because I was um, involved with this project from exploration all the way through to production. You can see here the little drill paths coming through, all the, the infill drilling and uh, sort of deposit modeling. And this is a copper deposit in DRC, so they're quite easy to identify there's nothing grows on top of the copper because of copper toxicity. And it's just for interest. So your key outcomes of this phase would be the tonnage available. You're going from a, a resource to reserve and then your grade of the deposit, market for the product, because you're not going to mine something unless you can sell it. So you need to see how stable the markets are, the commodity prices, etc. Then your mining method, you need to choose your best mining method and then your licensing. You need to have your licenses ready to go before you start breaking ground. In terms of groundwater studies, we do site characterization, baseline assessments, groundwater resource development if they need water supply for the, the operations. Hydrocensus, which identifies your INAPs around the site and existing groundwater users. Geophysics on surface and uh, down borehole to identify groundwater targets and uh, ore deposit targets. Your specialist studies for your EIAs, your water use licenses, your pre feasibility and bankable feasibilities. Groundwater modeling for both the, the impact assessments and for your mine designing. And then your dewatering strategy development typically starts to take shape in your exploration phase. Some of the specialist input to the feasibility studies would include your life cycle impact and cost assessments, where you look at, you compare your open pit mining versus your underground mining for an ore deposit, your dewatering costs, both your operational expenditure and your capital expenditure, the inflows in terms of impact on cost and on the environment, your dewatering impact zone, um, and then in some cases you do water treatment solution design and life cycle costing. You know, that would be, for example, at a coal mine where you need to do your closure costing before you start mining and you would need an AMD treatment plant um, costing and sort of allocation before you start your mining applications. Okay, then you go into your construction phase. We you do your pre-stripping, you remove your overburden and soils and stockpile it. And then you start installing your mining infrastructure in anticipation of extraction of ore. So you can see this site again. 
They've done the pre-stripping of the ore deposit, getting rid of all the topsoil. They've started stockpiling the topsoil here. Then they've got the plant platform taking shape there and the tailings dam taking shape over here. You can see the haul roads and the transport roads starting to take shape as well. Your key activities is to begin the implementation of your environmental systems. You, you start this in construction. This is your health and safety systems, your environmental management plans, etc. So that by the time you get to operational stages, this has become a culture on the site. Because in mining, it's all good and well to have a million policies and plans, etc. But if it's not a culture, it's very difficult to maintain and to to sort of uh, do continuous improvement on. You construct your access and haulage roads, your plant, waste and staff infrastructure. Yeah, if you need to have camp accommodation, you start construction on that. Your pre-stripping and then your infill and sterilization drilling. Has anybody heard the term sterilization drilling before? No. No. Okay. So sterilization drilling is, is quite important on a, a greenfield site. That's where you do exploration drilling at your, for example, here where you've got your plant production pad. You need to drill boreholes here to make sure that there's no ore underneath it. Because if you build your plant on top of a big ore deposit, you can never mine that, that ore effectively because you're going to have to knock down your whole plant and the cost is just going to wipe out any value. So wherever you need to do infrastructure, you just poke a hole or two in it just to make sure you're not building on top of a, a valuable deposit. And your duration of construction is between two and five years and your costs can go anywhere between 10 million and $500 million depending on the processing that you need and also what stage of beneficiation you get to. For example, this site, the plant was $100 million, but it didn't go onto the full um, copper product. It just went up to just before smelting. It didn't have a, sp a smelting plant. Okay, then you go into your operational phase which is the business end of the mine. This is where your oil is extracted, processed, and sold to market. You can see here they start mining. Your discard dumps start growing. Stockpiles start growing. Your processing plant is up to, up to scratch. And your tailings, you start depositing tailings material into your dams. Your economic, environmental, and water management systems are in full operation and you monitor them for continuous improvement. And then where it's applicable, you do your concurrent rehabilitation of the mine workings. So like I showed you in the strip mining, it's where you do your rollover mining. Your cost per annum per year ranges between five and $75 million. Yeah, this is dependent on your water requirements, your energy requirements, um, how many issues you have, your market prices as well. You know, if you have a, a market price crash in your particular commodity, you can lose a lot of money. So all of these things are continuously monitored and kept track of to make sure that the mine doesn't run at a loss. And during the operational phase, we get involved in the water monitoring. That is your quantity of water, your dewatering impacts, your water quality impacts, if any, uh, groundwater management, your system design, maintenance, optimization, dewatering system maintenance and optimization, and your groundwater modeling, continuous model updates, your source identification and characterization, which is um, what Antonio referred to in the chat about the isotopes you'll see where the potential sources of inflows to the pit can be coming from, where your contamination sources could be coming from. You know, all of those things are quite important. Uh, groundwater resource development, if additional water supply is needed. And then specialist studies for your EIA and water use license updates. And then you start your closure planning during the operational phase. 
you start thinking about getting things in line so that when you get to closure, it's not as cumbersome and time consuming and costly as it would be if you just started everything at the last minute. So in this picture here, you can see your depressurization wells on the pit wall here, and then your actual dewatering boreholes around the pit. So the dewatering boreholes will remove the water so it doesn't flow into the pit. And then your depressurization keeps the pressure off of your pit slopes. Does that make sense to everyone, the difference between your depressurization and your dewatering? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. It's a very high level definition, but uh, that's that's basically what the difference is. Okay. Then your closure or decommissioning phase, where it's applicable, your selected areas of the mining operation are decommissioned and broken down to be removed and completed. Mining areas are rehabilitated. You stop dewatering. Yeah, in your deactivated areas. As you can see, yeah, they stop dewatering and your pits start flooding. The tailings dam, the wet beach start shrinking. Your plant, they start breaking down the crushers and grizzlies and conveyors that they're no longer using. You know, it sort of starts winding down. And then you start cladding and vegetation of your waste infrastructure where it's applicable. This is where you start putting your, um, your geotextiles on the side of the tailings dams and you start capping off the tailings dam so that when you get to post-closure, it's, it's not that difficult to do. Okay, and in this phase, where we get involved is the specialist studies for the EIA and for the closure planning, uh, rehabilitation planning. That's selecting whether a backfill versus a pit lake would be better. Your closure planning, how to close, what to break down first, where the impacts would be and what measures to put in place. Groundwater modeling to identify the impacts before they start the processes. Water monitoring, quality and quantity. Water management solutions to make sure the impacts are mitigated. And then water treatment solution design and life cycle costing where applicable. In post-closure phase, this is once everything is stopped on site, there's no active mining. All of your dewatering, processing and beneficiation of the ore deposit has ceased. You start the backfilling. Yeah, these are all little waste rock piles that they're starting to backfill before contouring into the open pit. Your equipment and infrastructure are broken down and removed from site. You close off your haul roads, you close access roads, and you start uh, rehabilitating where possible. You backfill, like I said, backfill and rehabilitation of excavations and your waste infrastructure. So where possible, you remove the waste rock dumps and you put it back into the pit. And where that's not possible, you'll start your cladding and vegetation. And post-closure monitoring typically takes place for a minimum of two to five years. But uh, unless you get a closure license or you sell the asset, this sort of carries on in perpetuity. You'll, you know, the, the way that the South African legislation is structured is until you sell that asset or you get a closure license, you have to continue monitoring to make sure that the environmental impact is not, that, uh, is not out of hand. Now, can anybody tell me why we would clad and vegetate a discard dump or a tailings dam? Do you have any ideas on that? Uh, maybe to counter erosion in a way. Yeah, that's, uh, that's part of it. Um, anybody else? No. So the main reason that you want to do this, and especially on your coal mines, is to stop oxidation. You know, once you cover it up with soil and vegetation, 
you stop the oxidation of that coal product or you at least um, slow it down. You slow down the oxidation rate. So you stop your acid mine drainage potentially from getting to a, a sort of far stage. Then also your erosion. You stop that because the roots of the plants will bind together and hold the soil in. And then also your infiltration. You know, if there's no infiltration of water going through your, your waste rock dump, it can't transport any leachate from that waste rock dump into your groundwater system. Does that make sense to everybody? Is there anything yes. I left out? Okay. And then your closure license application process is started. So you start this, you quantify all your liabilities for the next 50 to 100 years. And you go to the department and you say, these are the rehabilitation measures that we've put in place. This is the liability. Can we close it and repurpose the land? Or you know, can we basically walk away from this now? What we do is a water liability assessment, which is part of one of the new government or relatively new legislative uh, regulations. We do groundwater modeling for your plume migration from the backfill material, your remnant discard dumps, which goes into your water treatment solution design and costing. Where applicable, we do pit lake characterization and then obviously your water quality monitoring and your water level rebound over time. Uh, this is where we do complete backfill in the pit. You've got your groundwater levels rebounding and then you've got potential decant at the lowest point of the pit. Or you've got your pit lake where you just leave the pit open and let it flood. You've got direct rainfall and evaporation contributing as well. Uh, so it's just a question. Um, yeah, Antonio, the, the acid mine drainage is where you do your management plans with your groundwater modeling and the, the sort of rehabilitation designs. You need to limit your oxidation potential of the materials. We'll go through it in one of the examples. And then your pit lake forms, it'll fill up to a natural level there. And then you'll get density stratification in your pit lake which is something that Lizelle can tell us all about in another session. Okay, so is everybody happy with the, the mining life cycle? Is there anything I've missed out or you'd want me to focus on a bit more? No, I'm going to carry on. So this is just a nice sort of Google Earth imagery showing the evolution of that mine in the DRC, going from exploration where you know we were living on top of the hill up here, intense in this phase, and we were doing exploration drilling here, little access roads there, just dirt tracks, and then you go into construction with the pre-stripping. You can see the continued exploration there. That was the management camp, and that was the contractor's camp. Your tailings dam was cleared out there. The vegetation was stripped, and the power station was put down. Your platform for the, the processing plant. And that's just a picture without the clouds. Then here's operational. They start mining. You can see the benches start to take place. The camps are established now. The tailings dam, they're starting to fill the one compartment. There's a return water dam for the tailings. See the tailings has now filled up the entire section there as the mining's got deeper and your discard dump is almost doubled in size. Yeah, processing plant here with your stockpile, secondary stockpile, tertiary stockpile. 
Yeah, they'd finished in this section, so they stopped dewatering. Carrying on in these benches here. You see your wet beach with your pen stock here. Return water dam. And then closure, this is where they'd stopped all dewatering activities. You see how everything is filled up. Yeah, and then you've got your final stockpiles over here and they start winding down the plant. Okay, so is there any questions on the... Any questions about the mining life cycle? Yes, Victor. Oh, yes, Matthew. I just want to ask, um, is it like, um, how would you advise in terms of like the, the just uh, as, as part of a cycle like when they just dewater and then they, they artificially recharge, sort of like artificial recharge after dewatering in the mine? Like, is it having... Does that does it have that uh, sort of like an impact in the mine or I mean in groundwater specifically when they do artificial recharging? I had some mines in sort of like Anglo they do re, um, artificial recharging as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, you'll see one of the examples I prepared um, is exactly that where you've got artificial recharge which flows back into your pit, um, and this is a big problem on a Concola mine in Zambia where they've built their tailings and everything sort of on top of their shafts and the tailings leak straight into your mining operations. Um, so no, definitely you've got to think uh, long term in terms of where you place your water bearing infrastructure, your waste rock, not waste rock, um, tailings dams, your pollution control dams. It definitely if it's inside your dewatering cone, it's most likely going to interact with your pit or your shaft. Okay, is that what you're asking uh, Victor yeah exactly exactly okay great so yeah you'll see it's actually quite a it was quite a nice project because you could see it quite clearly that the the waste infrastructure at the site was the problem not the actual groundwater environment Okay, so is there any questions before we carry on with uh, just two examples of applications of groundwater studies in mining? Nobody. Okay, so then I'm gonna carry on. What I've done is I've just prepared two examples of projects just to show the workflow, what we considered and how we executed the project. And your groundwater studies in mining fall into one of two broad categories. The first is your compliance studies, which is to identify and managers, manage the impacts of mining on the environment. And your second one is operational studies, which is to identify and manage the impacts of the environment on mining. So they're sort of opposite ends of the spectrum. One is to protect the environment from the mine and the other one is to protect the mine from the environment. So for compliance studies, we do baseline characterization, hydrosensis, groundwater resource development, conceptual model development, and then your specialist studies, your EIAs and water use licenses. And on the operational side, we do exactly the same. It's just as important to know these details from an operational perspective as it is from a compliance perspective. In terms of compliance studies, further studies we do is your groundwater modeling, your flow and transport modeling to show your dewatering impacts and your contaminant plume impacts, if any. Your groundwater impact assessment, the groundwater management plan to mitigate these impacts and then your acid mine drainage management strategy in a coal mine or a gold mine environment where there is acid mine drainage. 
on the operational side, typically the groundwater modeling is limited to flow modeling uh, because your main concern from an operational perspective is of course your dewatering. How much do I need to dewater? Can I dewater it effectively before it becomes a problem? Yeah, can I, what angle can I mine it with depressurization? Then your water make assessment, which is where is the water coming from? Is it my waste infrastructure? Is it natural groundwater? Is it surface water that's somehow entering my pit? And then water efficiency plan development, which reduces your costs on the mine. If you can recycle water for your processing plant and for drinking water and reduce your sort of water energy costs, piping it in, pumping it out of boreholes, that would be a first price from the operational side which of course has a benefit for the, the environment as well. Less freshwater requirements frees up water for other applications. Uh, sorry, Antonia, Vula is a water use license application. So that is to get your licensing through the South African government. So they allow you to abstract a certain amount of water Okay, so those are your two broad categories of application. Oops. So an example of a study for compliance, the site's a greenfield coal mine located in Pumalanga. The hydrogeological investigation is used in the site's environmental authorization processes. So it was for an EIA and a water use license. And the objective of the investigation was to characterize the baseline, invest, baseline environment at the site and the potential impacts that the proposed site activities would have on the receiving environment. So we had two open cast mines going from open cast one, 10 year life of mine, going from west to east. And then open cast two was about five year life of mine. You had a topsoil subsoil dump over here with your pollution control dams, your offices, processing plant, run of mine stockpiles, and then this is your waste rock dump here because they were doing rollover mining, so concurrent rehabilitation. The scope of work was based on the GNR 267 requirements for a Vula and a site-specific EIA. So we used the phased approach. Phase one was your data collection, review, and analysis. That was a desktop review and a hydro census. Then we did a field investigation at the site, which was geophysics, borehole installation, and aquifer testing for characterization of the site's hydrogeology. Phase three was aquifer characterization and impact assessment included geochemical assessment, conceptual model, the numerical modeling of flow and transport model, groundwater reserve determination to see if the water that they were proposing to abstract is sort of sustainable in the catchment, and then a groundwater impact assessment. And the last phase was reporting phase, which was a groundwater management plan and your technical report compilation. We've gone through this, this sort of scope of work design in one of our earlier sessions. So it's just to show you with that site specific problem, this is the scope of work that we applied. At the site, the coal is gonna be extracted from the upper seam and the bottom seam resources from the two open cost areas you saw with the previous figure. And they were gonna use conventional truck and shovel open cost mining and your activities would be topsoil and overburden removal and stockpiling, then drilling, charging, and blasting of hard overburden material, then loading and hauling, and then dumping. Something you need to be aware of is the blasting now is not as big an impact as it used to be in terms of groundwater quality. Um, since they switched over to a different type of explosive, yeah, in the old mines, you would see a lot of nitrate contamination from the explosives. Uh, whereas now, I think it's emulsion explosives that they use that are much lower nitrate concentration. Um, I mind you must correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a much lower impact in terms of groundwater quality than it used to be. Okay, 
Yeah, and then the planned life of mine was 10 years for the open cast one at the north, and then five years for open cast two at the south of the site. Average production rates is 1.5 megatons per annum, and your mining depth was on average to 60 meters for both pits. And then on the geochemical assessment, what we did was uh, three geological core samples were taken from one of the exploration holes, which represented waste rock, the ore material, and then discard material. And we submitted it to the lab for acid base accounting, which was uh, to indicate the long-term potential for acid mine drainage or acid rock drainage. And sulfur speciation, to indicate the amount of sulfides versus sulfates in the rock material. Net, net acid generating tests, which is indicate to the net potential for AMD or ARD after oxidation with hydrogen peroxide. And then X-ray diffraction to identify the minor to dominant minerals present in the rock. So the samples were carbonaceous shale, which is directly above your coal, then the coal material itself, and then the overburden material. So this would sit on my stockpile, the coal. Carbonaceous shale would sit in the pit as backfill material, and your overburden would be in the discard stockpiles and in the pit as backfill material. So that's why we sample these three sort of material categories. Does that make sense to everybody why we choose these particular rock groups to sample and analyze? Yes. And this is not only applicable to coal mining. In any mining environment, you're going to have these sort of three um, categories. You know, the carbonaceous shale and coal, you can sort of class as gang mineralogy. And then your coal is obviously your ore deposit. And then the overburden is overburden. You would have a similar setup in gold mining, platinum mining, copper mining, you'll always have these three broad categories of, of material that you would need to test and consider for contamination. Okay, so the way we tested or screened the, the NAG, the net acid generating results, we'll get the NAG pH and the NAG value, which is your sulfuric acid kilograms per tonne. And then your net neutralization potential, which is your calcium carbonate kilograms per tonne. So type 1A is a high capacity acid forming rock. 1B is lower capacity. 1B is uncertain. And then you've just got an uncertain one here. And then rock type 4 is non-acid forming. That's where your net neutralization potential is positive. Yeah, and uncertain is where you've got a negative um, net neutralization potential, but your, your pH is still uh, more than four. You see here, all of my pHs are less than four, so it's acidic. And here, my net neutralization potential is negative. So there is more acid forming potential than neutralizing potential. Yeah, this table is quite useful. Again, in acid base accounting interpretation, you've got your net neutralization potential, like I mentioned in the previous table. That is your neutralizing potential minus your acid forming potential. So that's fairly straightforward. If I've got more neutralizing material than acid, then I'm not going to generate acid uh, mine drainage. Another one we use is the neutralization potential ratio which is just the ratio of neutralization potential to acid potential. If it's less than one to one, you're likely gonna have acid mine drainage. One to two is possible acid mine drainage. Two to four is touch and go. And then more than four, you don't need to worry about acid mine drainage. And then the third category is your sulfide sulfur percentage, where if you've got less than 0.3%, of sulfides or sulfates, you've got rock type four, no potential. 
and if it's more than 0.3 percent you've got likely acid generating you need to do continuous geochemistry because remember this is like a grab sample you're sampling one point across a whole mine so you need to do continuous updating just to see how it's responding to actual oxidation and actual mining conditions but these two tables give you a good indication at the early stages Okay, then important thing we did is to identify groundwater sinks and sources. So a source is the groundwater recharge, where the recharge values are between one and 4% regionally. And the site recharge values were calculated from chemistry was two to 4%, which is within a realistic range. Then this table for coal mining is very important. This shows you your different recharge percentages for different types of mining infrastructure. So onto your leveled spoils where they've scraped it and made it nice and contoured, you're still going to get seepage of up to 30% or 20%. Your rehabilitated spoils, you're going to get 5 to 10% seepage. That's your spoils that have been cleared and contoured nicely properly. Your average seepage is 8% of annual rainfall. And then your unrehabilitated spoils where it's just a pile of of soil or discard material, you see how high your recharge can be, 30 to 80% and 60% on average. So these things are important to consider in your model, especially if you've got acid generation capacity in your backfill. Yeah, this influences your plume quite a bit. Then groundwater contribution to base flow, that's the river to the west of the site. You know, we separated the hydrograph and the groundwater Base flow contribution was about 0.1 cubes per second or 100 cubic meters per day per 100 meters of river channel. Again, important for the model and model calibration because you don't want to lower your base flow by dewatering. Yeah, I'm just going to skim this very quickly. This is a vulnerability assessment that I did with the drastic method or the DRASTI method in South Africa. Has anybody heard of this drastic or drastic method before? Yes, yes. I did one for uh, a company or ACI in Waterfontein a couple of years ago. Okay. But it's a very difficult to use. Yeah, great. That's quite a straightforward method. Um, you know, what you do, the, the full method is called drastic. So it's depth to groundwater, recharge, aquifer material, soil, topography, and the, the VADOS zone. And then the C stands for conductivity. Uh, but in the South African environment, because we've got the fractured rock aquifers where there's such a high variance in conductivity, you can leave it out and still get a representative value. Something that's important, you'll see I've got these blocks here. It has to be, for the method to be applicable, you have to have an area bigger than 0.4 kilometers squared or at minimum 635 by 635 meters otherwise the the maths just doesn't work it's not representative but you can see here's my coal mining and there's highly vulnerable aquifers along the river because the river interacted with groundwater and then on your topographic ridges you have the least vulnerable um, areas And then we built a numerical model for the site. Got general head boundary here associated with the structure, then perennial river cells for the rest of the, the boundaries. And then here's another geological contact. You can see my boundaries are far away enough from my mining area so that my mining doesn't interact either through dewatering or contaminant transport with my model boundary. That's something we went through in the modeling session. And here's my initial parameters. You can see I've got my different hydrogeological units or rock units. And then I've got my value that I initially assigned. And then my range of values based on the site results and the literature values. So you can see during calibration, I moved between 0 0.05 and 0 0.5. If it was higher or lower than that, that's not representative for my site. And I need to relook really at my conceptual model. 
Okay, steady state calibration parameters. My head variance in my data set was 87 meters. So my criteria for calibration was 8.7. And my final root mean square was 5.3, which was under that criteria. So it was considered calibrated. Transient state calibration, where I simulated the mining, where it was a changing or transient environment. My values varied by 66 meters, my head values. And then the residual compliance was 6.6. .6, and my root mean square was 6.2, which was compliant with my residual head criteria. So it was considered calibrated. Okay, and then with the calibrated model, I ran seven different scenarios. So the base case scenario was where the mining was as per the base case mining plan, which is where it's gear one, two, up to 10, and then open cost two. And my concurrent rehabilitation took place. Site PCD and stockpile areas were unlined, which is what the client had sort of budgeted for and planned in their mine planning. Scenario one, mining was as per the base case scenario with the site PCD and stockpiles unlined, but there was no concurrent rehabilitation. That was to assess the worst case dewatering scenario where everything was just left open and water kept flowing into the void. Scenario two was where mining took place from east to west. So it sort of flipped the mine plan on its head to limit the interaction with the river here and everything else was the same. Scenario three was where the PCD and stockpile areas were lined with clay. Scenario four, the stockpiles and PCD were lined again and the mine plan was from east to west again. Then scenario five and six considered a grout curtain between the mining areas and the river just to see what impact this would have on both the dewatering extent and the uh, contaminant plume extent in terms of the river and wetland areas. So do the scenarios, do you guys understand and see why the scenarios were chosen for this, this project? Do you see any other scenarios that should have been considered? Nobody. What about climate change? Should we not consider changes in rainfall? Yeah, you know, something that Water Affairs is now asking for in, in terms of your water use licenses is uh, climate change consideration. How would you see that being incorporated into this model? What kind of scenario would you run there? Maybe increased rainfall. Yeah, there we go. That's exactly it. Um, you know, what I'm doing with the project now is I've got the, the futures rainfalls that have been modeled by the, the sort of World Climate Organization. And then you run scenarios where you say, if we go on socioeconomic path one, where the increase in temperature is two degrees over the next hundred years, um, then this will be the impact because there's less recharge, less dewatering, you know, et cetera. So these are things now with the new decisions by water affairs um, that you need to start taking into consideration. Less rainfall, more rainfall, flooding, drought. All of those things need to be taken into consideration with your environmental applications now. Yes, Bella. Hi, Matthew. Um, I remember for my honors project, right, I had to, but I used EPA net to model um, mm. the, the volume changes. And what we did is we had to produce scenarios for different, for three different seasons during dry, dry seasons, normal rainfall seasons and 
um, your high rainfall seasons. So, yeah. No, that's exactly it. It's, it's very important to, to simulate these things because it allows you to plan for the worst case scenario, which might be a flood, it might be a drought. You know, if there's a flood and it washes away my stockpiles, what is the impact on the river system going to be? What is the impact on my groundwater system going to be? Uh, what happens if there's a drought? You know, the, the water levels start declining naturally. What is the impact going to be on my, my water balance at the site? What is the impact going to be on the environment? All of these things you need to sort of plan for so that you can plan a management strategy for them. It's not about mitigating them necessarily, but it's managing them in a way that the impact is limited. Yes, that's true. Okay, so carry on. So this is just an example of what the impact assessment table will look like. Yeah, this is for the construction phase. So your impact on groundwater quantity is vegetation clearing and groundwater dewatering from your abstraction borehole that might be used. The clearing of your vegetation may result in increased runoff and reduced recharge to the groundwater system. Then you do your impact according to magnitude of the impact, scale of the impact. Is it site specific? Is it regional? You know, those kind of things, the duration of the impact. Is it short term? Is it long term? Is it permanent? And then the probability of your impact occurring. And that gives you your risk assessment rating. Then you propose your management and mitigation measures. So for vegetation clearing to limit the impact, you should limit your areas for clearing as far as possible. And then for your groundwater dewatering, you need to implement your monitoring of water levels and pump schedules, etc. See, there it goes from a low impact rating 10 to a low impact rating 5. During construction, your groundwater quality impacts are limited to hydrocarbon spills from your construction vehicles and your domestic waste generation because you're not mining yet, so you're not extracting anything yet or processing anything. So I'm not going to go through each of these in detail. You guys can read through it uh, at a later stage. But this is the concept of your impact assessment. What's the impact? Why is it an impact? How bad is it? What can I do to limit this? And if I do this, how low can it go? You see here we've reduced the hydrocarbon from a medium to a low risk by bunding it and making sure that there's spill kits and appropriate response plans in place at the site. Okay, and then on operational side for groundwater quantity, it's dewatering. So I've run different impacts per model scenario. You see here it's high impact for scenario one, which is where I don't have concurrent rehabilitation. So from here, you can see that that's a no-go. That's a high impact. It's not going to be sustainable, so don't do it. That's why you do your impact tables. Okay, and then, sorry, this is a bit small, but your quality, you've got backfill material leachate from your concurrent rehabilitation, then your seepage from the pollution control dam, and then your waste rock and stockpile leachate as well generating plumes. And then closure, impact is groundwater level rebound, and then decant, which is potential because of the backfilling, and then poor quality leachate from your backfill material, because all of your discard dumps are going to be removed and put back into the pit. Okay, so that's sort of a compliance study. That's how we approach it. And you want to show the impacts that it's going to have on the environment and then develop an appropriate management plan for those impacts. Yeah, so this table, these tables almost are going to be your, your big product from these compliance studies. Is we acknowledge the impact we're going to have and this is how we're going to manage those impacts.
Does that make sense? Yes, Matthew, makes sense. Awesome. Uh, Matthew, I have a question, just like mm. one question. Um, the values, like the 21, 32, 36, like is there a document that you compare it to so that you know that, okay, with this impact, it means it's a 21, it means it's low. Like, what do you mm. use to compare to get these values? Yeah, there's, there's a classification system. I'll actually include it when I upload the document. Um, but for each of these, like for magnitude, you'll have a value that says one is um, minor, two is semi-minor, but a little bit more serious, and five is high impact, or I don't know what the impact is. So you've got these tables for each of the parameters. And then you calculate your risk by saying multi um, magnitude plus scale plus duration multiplied by probability. So yeah, you've got two plus one plus four is equal to seven multiplied by three gives you 21. Yeah. And then you've got these brackets that's zero to 30 is low. Then 30 to 60 is medium and then 60 and above is high. Oh, okay. So you'll have these kind of things. I'll include it as a slide when I upload it. Um, but that, that's how you do that. Thank you. And then what the department wants as well is sort of a hierarchy of impacts, which the EEPs do more than us. Um, but you'll sort of pick which one is the most important and which one is the, the easiest to handle, etc. Yeah, that's a whole field on its own after, I think. Any other questions? Yeah, can you give it? Oh, I was saying thank you. Okay. Lizelle? Is waste classification part of the compliance part or is that more when you start to operate when you do the waste classification? Um, you do need to do your waste classification for your, um, your water use license because that's related to your liner selection. So if you need to do a class A, B, C or D liner, Oh, so, yes. Yeah, so that, that's sort of mm -hmm. legislated where it says if you L1 or, you know, those sort of classifications, you need this yes. kind of liner. Okay, thanks. Yeah, cool. Yeah, look, the waste classification, um, a groundwater specialist doesn't need to do that. I've seen often like a surface water guy would do that or the EEP would do that themselves because it's sort of, if your chemistry falls within this bracket, this is what you need to do. There's not like with the geochemical assessment, you need to interpret it. You need to do the NAG and the ABA interpretations. Um, so sometimes the waste classification is done by the EEP or the surface water guy. That's why I didn't include it here. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Cool. And waste classification is also more specific to a dump. So it would be your discard dumps, it would be a landfill. So it's got a broader application than just mining, I think. But uh, it's a good question, Lizelle, thanks. Any other questions before we carry on with an operational example? No, I'm gonna carry on then. Okay, so this example here, we were contracted to perform a comprehensive review of an existing mine, which was in the process of expanding its dewatering network. The objective was to review all the existing information in the current conceptual model to determine the need for additional wells, which obviously has a cost implication as a licensing application. Yeah, if they don't need the dewatering wells, then you don't wanna install it. Okay, we did this by doing a baseline review of the environment, all of the available information, um, monit groundwater monitoring trend analysis. We looked at the quality evolution and the water level trends, and then by doing an impact assessment for the site. What is the impact of not dewatering versus dewatering, expanding versus not expanding? So those were the big three scopes that we had in this project. 
Okay, so the climate you had a mean annual precipitation of 455 mils per annum. So it's a fairly dry area. You can see most years stay below 600 except for 2009, which was almost double the amount of rainfall. So we had our climate. The hydrogeological setting, there were three aquifer systems at the site. Yeah, there was a shallow weathered zone or quaternary deposit unit at the top, followed by an intergranular and fractured unit, and then a localized structural unit, which was associated with the regional faults and um, sort of structures crossing across the site. The water level trends, we did um, three different types of water level trend. We had a decreasing trend where your water level was getting deeper. Stable trend where it was staying more or less the same aside from seasonal fluctuations. And then an increasing trend where the water level was rising. We found that the dewatering had only impacted structurally associated boreholes. So your boreholes in the shallow weathered unit and the intergranular unit weren't really impacted on by dewatering. Then the water quality data we went through and we got uh, baseline and site specific data for the region. The water quality we looked at in terms of the water quality standards, obviously, just to see any impacts there. And then we plotted on a pipe and Durov to evaluate the water facies and any relationship between the ground and surface water at the site, as well as water evolution, if it changed from one type of water to another. Predominant water type was a calcium magnesium bicarbonate with minor sodium bicarbonate and sodium chloride type waters. And now we did recharge calculations for the regional boreholes to give us a baseline and then the boreholes at the mine as well to give us a site-specific recharge calculation. We use the chloride mass balance equation and your baseline recharge was one to three and a half percent of precipitation while at the site the recharge was between 0.2 and 1.2 percent of precipitation. You can see here uh, most of my boreholes are sitting at this 1.2 range. These are regional boreholes unaffected by mining. Then the site recharge using the chloride concentration from rainfall was all under 1.2%. Most of it actually under 0.4%. So we compared this to the actual dewatering volumes and these recharge values were unrepresentative. With this recharge to groundwater and the extent of the dewatering cone, it was almost impossible that this was realistic. You know, you were dewatering orders of magnitude higher than what you should have had in the groundwater system. So what we did was we changed the chloride concentration in the, the mass balance equation to be the surface water storage infrastructure. So your tailings dam, your storage dams instead of rainfall. And this showed the recharge to be between 20 and 100% of mean annual precipitation, which was more representative as it actually supplied the, the water that they were dewatering. So the conclusion that we reached is that the recharge to the mining area was generally due to seepage from the nearby storage facilities. So that, what that means is that they had to extend their dewatering infrastructure to take care of these um, inflows without impacting the environment because the dewatering is not impacting anywhere on the surroundings. It's just sort of extracting their seepage from their infrastructure, which is what Victor was asking about earlier. Yeah, so he has the adjusted calculations where you've got an average recharge of sort of 40% of MAP going up to 180%, which gave us the dewatering volumes that they were actually pumping. And from this, we had two conceptual models. We had the far hydrogeological unit, which is something that uh, Donis 
you know, we spoke about briefly at uh, Zambia. You've got this far aquifer unit, which is unimpacted on by mining. And then you've got the near aquifer unit, which is the one that the mining is sort of creating its own ecosystem almost. Because you've got seepage coming in from your mine storage, going into your pit. And then the impact on the outside of this area is minimal. So, is there any questions? Everybody happy on how to do a mining study now? Or what we do in mining? I think just the one thing we can maybe touch on or add is underground water management in terms of how the mines manage the water um, compartment wise and mm. the risk factors they take into account when they manage the underground water and how they, how they store and pump it to surface. Um, look, I mean, that's something I don't have a lot of personal experience with. Um, yeah, I know it's there, but I, I'd rather not talk too much about it. I don't know, Amant, if you have experience with it, yeah, then that'll be great to hear. But, um, you yeah, know, my experience is limited to sort of academic experience. So I'd rather, rather not, you know what I mean? I understand. Just in terms of, of the water use license as well, we're now busy assisting one of the mines, one of the operational mines with updating their water use license. And in terms of this underground water management, it's very important for them to do it in their water balance. So I think it's also important just to highlight that the groundwater and the abstraction, all of this actually feeds into the, uh, the water balance that also goes into water science application. No, definitely. And I think uh, that contributes to your water make and, and all of those things. And that's where your source identification plays a role in your, your studies as well, is to see you know, what's the impact of storing it underground versus pumping it all the way to surface. Um, all those kind of things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry, I can't expand too much, but I'd rather, I don't want to tell you guys the wrong things. <laughs> so I'd rather stick to my lane, you know. Anyone else, any questions or comments or anything you want to sort of go through a bit more? Nobody. Okay. Well, then I think uh, we'll call it for today. And um, you know, thank you guys for, for taking the time to join us and for your questions and inputs. Um, I hope you you learned something. And if there's any questions, you know, please use the LinkedIn group. You know, feel free to post any questions, any comments, anything interesting that you see, or yeah, let's. Uh, Let's talk to each other. But other than that, then I will see you guys again on the 17th of September. We'll go through management, groundwater management, water management, and how to do those kind of studies. So thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks Matthew. Matthew. Um, I just want to add, uh, maybe we can add the transboundary aquifers to the next session or the last session okay. um, because it's kind of a relevant topic at the moment and I think it will um, you know, go along with the isotopes and uh, groundwater surface water interaction that Antonia mm -hmm. mentioned. Okay, great. Uh, no, I'll definitely... Yeah. Make a note of that. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Okay, thanks, guys. And uh, we'll see you in, what's it, two weeks' time. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Great. Thanks, guys.